Hello, STAT 200. Welcome to the full video lecture for Lesson 5, Hypothesis Testing, Part 1. The content that's covered in this video can be found in the LOC 5 textbook in Chapter 4, Sections 1, 2, and 3. The full video lectures can get long, so I recommend that you take breaks in the middle of this video to review the online notes or textbook or to walk through some examples on your own. These are the learning objectives that we're going to be covering this week. As always, these will serve as an outline for this video. If you're watching this video on YouTube, under the video in the description, you can find timestamps to jump ahead to any of these topics. Let's start with a quick review. These are all of the population parameters that we'll be working with this week, along with their respective sample statistics. If you don't feel comfortable with these symbols yet, you should review these before starting this lesson because they'll come up quite a bit. Recall that population parameters are fixed values. It's often difficult or impossible to collect data from the entire population, so in many cases we collect data from a subset of the population known as a sample. Sample statistics are random variables because they differ from sample to sample. Last week, we used data from samples to estimate population parameters by constructing confidence intervals. In this lesson, we're going to continue to study statistical inference, but we will be focusing on formal hypothesis testing. We use hypothesis testing methods when we have a specific hypothesis to test. We use data from a sample to determine if that sample could have reasonably come from a population with a hypothesized population parameter. Let's look at an example of a scenario where we could apply hypothesis testing. A company claims that only 2% of their products break within the first month. You have purchased 50 of these products and four have broken within the first month. Do you have evidence to claim that more than 2% of this company's products break within a month? Here we have a company that is claiming that in the population, the proportion of products that break within a month is 0.02. Assuming that we have a random sample of products from this company, we can find the probability that a population where P equals 0.02 would produce a sample of 50 products with four or more that break within a month. We'll walk through this example throughout this video. We'll write hypotheses and conduct a randomization test. Before we start walking through the different steps and our different learning objectives this week, I want to show you the big picture, which is our five-step hypothesis testing procedure. We'll walk through these steps in greater detail as we work our way through the learning objectives, but this is to give you an idea of where we're going to end up. The first step of the five-step hypothesis testing procedure that we'll be using is to determine what type of test you need to conduct and write the hypotheses. What I mean by determine what type of test you need is that you need to identify what population parameter you are testing. In this lesson, we're covering tests for a single proportion, single mean, difference in two proportions, difference in two means, correlation, and simple linear regression slopes. The second step is to construct a randomization distribution given that the null hypothesis is true. A randomization distribution is very similar to the bootstrap distributions that you made last week. The main difference is that with hypothesis testing, we have a hypothesized population parameter, so we can use that as the center of our sampling distribution. Again, we'll see examples of this as we move through the learning objectives in a minute. The third step is to use the randomization distribution to find the p-value. We'll do this in StatKey this week. The fourth step is to decide if you should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. We'll talk about the procedures for how we do this this week. Next week, we'll go into more detail with this as well. And the last step is to state a real-world conclusion in relation to the original research question. Let's start working through our learning objectives now. Our first learning objective is to identify and write null and alternative hypotheses. This corresponds to the first step in the five-step hypothesis testing procedure. Regardless of the parameter that's being tested, you're going to have two hypotheses, 
the null and the alternative. The null hypothesis we often write as h sub zero. This is a statement of no difference in the population because null means nothing. The alternative hypothesis then is h sub a. This is a statement of a difference in the population. In order to write her hypotheses, there's three pieces of information that we need. First, we need to know what parameter is being tested. These are all of the parameters that we'll be working with this week. To determine which parameter we're testing, we need to look at the scenario. The second piece of information that we need is the direction. Again, we'll need to look at the scenario. It will tell us if we want to know if the parameter is greater than, less than, or just different from a given value. That will determine which sign goes in our alternative hypothesis. And the third piece of information that we need to know is the hypothesized value of the population parameter. For a single proportion or a single mean, we'll be given a number in the scenario. For difference in two proportions and difference in two means, the number is usually zero, because if there is no difference between the two groups, then the difference is zero. For correlation and slope, the hypothesized parameter value is also typically zero, because if there is no relationship between the two variables, the correlation will be zero and the slope would be zero. In the online notes, there are these tables for all of the parameters that we're covering this week. For each one, it gives you three different possible research questions. Of course, the scenarios that you get won't use these exact words, but you'll need to determine if your research question is asking about a difference, which has no direction, or if it's asking if the parameter is greater than a given value or less than a given value. In all of these examples, note that mu sub zero is the hypothesized population mean. So this will be replaced by a number when you write these hypotheses. This is the table for the difference between two proportions. Again, you would look at your scenario to determine if you want to know if the proportions are different or if you want to know if one is greater than or less than the other. You can see at the bottom here, that p sub 1 equals p sub 2 is equivalent to saying p sub 1 minus p sub 2 equals 0. I'll write it like this sometimes so that it's clear that the hypothesized parameter value is 0. One last table to look at here. This one is for Pearson's R. Remember these tables for all the parameters that we're covering this week are in the online notes. On this one, I want to point out that the hypothesized parameter value is always zero. This is because if there's no relationship in the population, then the population correlation would be zero. Now let's look at some examples to practice writing hypotheses. Here's the scenario that I showed you earlier. Of all this information, all we really need to know to write our hypotheses are the parameter, the direction, and the hypothesized value of the parameter. Let's start with the parameter. The variable of interest is broken products, specifically whether or not the product breaks within the first month. This is a categorical variable because either the product breaks within a month or it doesn't. We'll be testing the proportion of all products that break. The parameter of interest here is a single proportion. Next, we need to determine the direction. We want to know if the proportion that breaks is more than. The direction here is greater than. This is what we would call a right-tailed test because if the parameter is greater than a value, it will be on the right side of a plot. And finally, the hypothesized value of the parameter. We're given that this is 2% which translates to a proportion of 0.02. Now let's look at the table from the online notes for a single proportion. This will help remind us of how to properly format our hypotheses. We said that the direction was going to be greater than, so we'll be looking at the middle column here. We just need to replace these P sub O's with our hypothesized parameter value, 
This gives us a null hypothesis of P equals 0 0.02 and an alternative hypothesis of P is greater than 0 0.02. Here's another example. In the population of all American women, is there a correlation between age in years and number of necklaces owned? Again, we need to know the parameter, the direction, and the hypothesized value of the parameter. The research question states that we're looking for a correlation. That's our parameter. The scenario doesn't give us a direction, and this is where students sometimes get tripped up. Even if you could guess which direction the relationship should be in, you need to go off of what is stated in the research question. This research question asks if there is a correlation. It does not specify positive or negative, so this will be a non-directional test. In terms of the hypothesized value of the parameter, if there is a correlation, that means that Pearson's R is different from zero, so our hypothesized value of the parameter will be zero. Let me pull up the table from the online notes for a correlation. We said that this was a non-directional test, so we're working with this column. The null is that rho is equal to zero, and the alternative is that rho is not equal to zero. Let's do one last example. A researcher wants to compare men and women who take online courses. They want to know if men who take online courses tend to be younger than women who take online courses. The first thing we need to do is determine the parameter that we're testing. We have two groups here, men and women, and these are independent groups. We're comparing them in terms of age, which is most likely a quantitative variable, which would be summarized with a mean. Difference in two independent means is what we'll call this test. In terms of direction, we want to know if men tend to be younger than women. This gives us our direction. When we're comparing two groups, the hypothesized value of the parameter is almost always going to be zero. This is because if there's no difference between the two groups, the difference will be zero. Here's our table from the online notes for the difference in two means. We want to know if the mean for men was less than the mean for women. So this is the last column. We could actually leave these hypotheses as they are here, but I usually change the subscripts so that it's very clear which is group one and which is group two. This is most important for the directional tests because if you flip the two groups, you'd end up with different results. The null hypothesis is that the population mean for the men is equal to the population mean for the women. The alternative is that the population mean for the men is less than the population mean for the women. If you want to see more examples, there's a full page of these in the online notes. That concludes our first learning objective. Our second learning objective is to describe randomization procedures. Last week, we used bootstrapping procedures to make a sampling distribution to construct a confidence interval. This week, we're going to use randomization procedures to construct sampling distributions that we'll be using to conduct hypothesis tests. The methods are very similar. They're both based on resampling procedures, which means that they use data from a sample and using a variety of different methods, pull different variations of the samples to build a sampling distribution. The primary difference is that with bootstrapping, our sampling distribution was centered on the observed sample statistic. With randomization procedures, our sampling distribution will be centered on the hypothesized population parameter. And this is because the purpose is different. With confidence intervals, we were estimating the population parameter when we had no preconceived idea of what its value could be. With hypothesis testing, we do have a hypothesized value of the population parameter. I think randomization procedures are a bit more complicated than bootstrapping procedures, because the way that it's done varies more depending on whether you have a single proportion, single mean, difference in two groups, or relationship between two quantitative variables with correlation or slope. And even within some of those, 
there are multiple different methods available. Distinguishing between those methods is really an intermediate topic that we're not going to have time to tackle in this course. But if you're interested in learning more, there is a page in the online notes that is labeled as optional that describes all of the randomization methods that are available in StatKey. I'll take you over to StatKey now to walk through a few examples. StatKey has five different options here for randomization hypothesis tests. I'll walk through an example of constructing a randomization distribution for each of these different parameters. To help speed this up, I'm going to use data sets that are built into StatKey. There will be more examples at the end of this video, and there are some in the online notes as well that show you how to copy and paste data from elsewhere, or for proportions, how to enter in summary data yourself. The process is the same as it was for bootstrapping last week. Let's start by looking at an example for a single mean. I'll use the first data set that is built into StatKey, body temperature. On the upper right, we see the original sample. We have data concerning the body temperatures for a representative sample of 50 adults here. Remember, for randomization tests, you need to have a hypothesized value. That value will show up here, where it says null hypothesis. For this data set, the null hypothesis is that the population mean is 98.6. In other words, the mean body temperature in the population of all adults is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You can click on this number to change its value. But for this example, I'm going to use the default 98.6. For a single mean, what StatKey is going to do is shift the original sample so that it has a mean of 98.6. Then it will take a random sample of n equals 50 with replacement, just like we did with bootstrapping last week. So it's really just adding that one step of shifting the original distribution to have a mean of 98.6, and then it's the same as bootstrapping. Let's start with just one resample. Now on the bottom right, we have our first resample. If you hover over these values, you can see that they're not exactly the same as they were up top. Here we have 101.140, whereas here that value was 100.8. This is because the original sample was shifted so that the mean would be 98.6. In this case, they would have shifted to the right by 0.34 to make this mean 98.6 before taking this randomization sample. The mean of our first resample is plotted here on the randomization dot plot, just like it was last week with bootstrapping. Let's take another sample. The mean of the second resample, again, is plotted here on the randomization dot plot. Something different here is that the arrow and the number at the bottom will always be equal to the null parameter. We should always take at least 5,000 resamples to get a good picture of the randomization distribution. Here's our randomization distribution for this test for a single mean. We'll come back to this later in the next learning objective to see how to get the p-value from this distribution. But first, I want to continue showing you how the randomization distributions are constructed for different parameters. This was one sample mean. Next, let's do one sample proportion. For this example, I'm going to use the NFL coin flip wins over time example because I think coin flips are an easy scenario to understand. The hypothesized parameter by default is that P equals 0.5 because when flipping a coin, we assume that there's a 50% chance 
of calling it correctly. On the upper right, we can see that in our original sample, there were 240 wins out of 428 trials for a sample proportion of 0.561. For one sample proportion, the original sample proportion is not going to impact the randomization distribution. What we need to construct the randomization distribution are just the original sample size and the hypothesized population parameter. StatKey is going to take a random sample of 428 here, where the probability of success for each trial is 0 0.5. Let's take one resample. In our first resample of the 428 trials, there were 229 successes for a sample proportion of 0 0.535, which is plotted on our randomization dot plot. Let's take another resample. This time, there were 218 successes out of the 428 trials for a sample proportion of 0 0.509, which again is plotted on our larger dot plot. Again, the number at the bottom will always be the null parameter. Let's take a few thousand more resamples to get us up to at least 5,000. And here's our randomization distribution for a single proportion. Now, let's do an example for the difference in two means. This is where randomization procedures can get more complicated. StatKey offers three different randomization methods when examining the difference in the means of two groups. In this course, we're always going to use the default reallocate groups method. Using the reallocate method, all cases in the two groups are combined and then randomly assigned to the two groups with the same sample sizes as the original samples. This is done without replacement. The mean of each reallocated sample is computed and the difference between those reallocated samples means is recorded on the randomization distribution dot plot. Let's look at an example. I'll use the data set called exercise hours, males versus females. In the original sample, there are 20 males on the bottom dot plot and 30 females on the top dot plot. For some reason, StatKey puts the first sample on the bottom and the second sample on the top. What is group one and what is group two is determined by the order that the data are entered. If I click on show data table, we can see that males were entered first and females were entered second which is why the males are group one and the females are group two here. The difference in sample means is always computed as the mean for group one minus the mean for group two. Here, that means the mean for the males minus the mean for the females. To construct our randomization distribution here using the reallocate groups method, StatKey is going to combine the males and the females to have one big group of 50, then it will randomly assign 20 cases to group 1 and 30 cases to group 2. Let's take one resample. Here we can see that one of the values that was originally a male is now in the female group. The difference between the two groups in this resample is negative. 2.42, which is plotted on the larger dot plot. We can do this again in our second resample. The difference is negative 1.25, which again is plotted on the larger randomization dot plot. 
I'll take a few thousand resamples to get us to at least 5,000. And here's our sampling distribution. The arrow in the mean at the bottom point to zero because when we're looking at the difference between the two groups, the null or the hypothesized null value is zero. If there was no difference between the mean of males and the mean of females, then the mean of males minus the mean of females would equal zero. To summarize what we did here, we said that if there's not a difference between males and females in the population, in terms of how many hours per week they exercise, and we were to take many random samples of 20 males and 30 females from that population, this is what the distribution of the difference in sample means would look like. So this is all done under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, and the population mean for males and the population mean for females are equal. We still have two more examples to go through. Next, we'll look at the difference in two proportions. Here, StatKey offers two different randomization methods. We'll be using the default reallocation method again. This procedure is the same as the reallocate groups procedure for two group means that we just saw. Again, all of the observations in the samples are combined and then randomly assigned between the two groups with sample sizes that match the original sample. This is done without replacement. Again, we can't change the hypothesized value here. It's always going to be that the two population proportions are equal. I'll use the data set own tablet by sex. We're comparing males and females in terms of whether or not they own a tablet. We can see our original sample on the right. In our sample, 197 out of 455 males owned a tablet and 235 out of 504 females owned a tablet. What StatKey is going to do here is combine all of the males and females to form one big group of 959 and it will randomly split them into a group of 455 and a group of 504 to match the original sample sizes. Let's do this once. Here in our first randomization sample, you can see that we still have 455 in the males group and 504 in the females group. These sample sizes should always match the sample sizes in the original sample. The counts, however, are going to be different. Here in the male group, there were 214 successes, and in the female group, there were 218 successes. The sum of these two groups should equal the sum of successes in the original sample, though. So 214 plus 218 equals 432 which is the same as 197 plus 235 in the original sample. This difference in sample proportions, again, is plotted on the larger randomization dot plot. I'll take at least 5,000 randomization samples now to build our randomization distribution. Again, this is centered on zero because if the population proportions are equal, the difference between them is zero. I also want to point out that this distribution is approximately normal. When sample sizes are large, the sampling distributions, regardless of whether it's a proportion, mean, difference in proportions, difference in means, correlation, they'll all be approximately normally distributed. As the sample sizes get larger, they'll get closer to a normal distribution, and we'll learn more about that in Lesson 7. There's one more example that I need to walk through here, and that is for slope or correlation. Both slope and correlation deal with the relationship between two quantitative variables, and that's why they're combined here. Once you get in, you can switch between correlation and slope, for this example, I'm going to use correlation. 
There are no different randomization options available for this one. Regardless of if you're testing a correlation or a slope, stat key will take all of the pairs of X and Y, split up those pairs, and it will randomly assign each X value to a Y value. So you'll end up with all of the same X values and all of the same Y values, but the pairings will be different. Let's look at the Florida Lakes example. In our original sample, we have 53 measurements. We're looking at pH level on the x-axis and mercury level on the y-axis. I'll take one resample. This plot looks completely different because all of the x and y pairs have been randomly reassigned. The correlation in this first resample is negative 0 0.085, which shows up here on our dot plot. I'll take a few thousand samples, at least 5,000, to get a good picture of our randomization distribution. Again, this is centered on zero, because if there's no correlation in the population, then rho equals zero. We have just walked through examples of constructing every type of randomization plot that we're going to cover in this course. I'll take you back to the PowerPoint slides now to move on to the next learning objective, but we'll be back here in StatKey very soon. Our third learning objective is to determine p-values using randomization methods in StatKey and Minitab Express. If we look back at our five-step hypothesis testing procedure, we've essentially covered steps one and two so far. After we make our randomization distribution in step two, the next step is to find the p-value. P-values are possibly one of the most misunderstood and misinterpreted statistical concepts, but they're incredibly important because this is the value that is used to make decisions. Here's the definition of a p-value. Given that the null hypothesis is true, the probability of obtaining a sample statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one in the observed sample in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. Remember that when we constructed our randomization distributions, they were all centered on the hypothesized value, which is the number in the null hypothesis. In other words, they were all constructed given that the null hypothesis is true. So this first part of the definition we've covered when we constructed the randomization distribution. What the rest of the definition is telling us is that we need to find the proportion of the randomization distribution that is as or more extreme than our observed sample statistic in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. I'll take you back to StatKey to run through some examples. Let's walk through the same examples that we did earlier when we were constructing randomization distributions. This time, we'll just take it one step further by finding the p-value. We can start with a single mean. We used the default body temperature data set, and the hypothesized parameter was 98.6 degrees. We took 5,000 samples to build our randomization distribution. To this point, this is all a review from the second learning objective. What is new now is that we're going to find the p-value by looking at the proportion of this sampling distribution that is more extreme than the observed sample statistic, which from our original sample was 98.26. We have the option of doing a left-tailed, two-tailed, or right-tailed test. This is going to depend on our research question. Let's say that we want to know if the population mean is less than 98.6. Less than tells us that we're doing a left tail test. We select left tail. We want to know the proportion of this distribution that is less than 98.26. Click the blue box under the distribution to change the cutoff value. We'll change this to 98.26. The proportion in the tail has changed. The proportion of this distribution that is less than 98.26 
is 0 0.0016. This is our p-value. Let's do a few more examples of just finding the p-value. Then in the next learning objective, you'll see how we use this p-value. The next example I'll do is for a single proportion. Let's go back to the NFL coin flip wins overtime data set. For this example, let's say that I want to know if the proportion of wins is different from 0 0.5. This is going to be a two-tailed test now because I didn't specify greater than or less than. I want to know if there is some difference, and that difference could be in either direction. I'll take at least 5,000 resamples to build our randomization sampling distribution. This was a two-tailed test, so I'll select two-tail. We need to change the cutoff at the bottom to match our sample proportion. Our sample proportion from the original sample was 0 0.561. For two-tailed tests, you need to make sure that you change the correct value. Our sample proportion of 0 0.561 would fall here on the right side, so we're going to change the cutoff value on the right. This will be 0 0.561. For a two-tailed test, the p-value will be the area in the two tails combined. 0 0.0092 plus 0 0.0092 gives us a p-value of 0 0.0184. The next example that I'm going to show you will be for the difference in two means. I'll use the exercise hours data set again. Here, let's say we want to know if males tend to exercise more than females. With the difference in means or difference in proportions test, you'll need to pay special attention to which is group one and which is group two. Here, group one we said was males and group two is females. If males exercise more than females, then we would expect the mean of group one minus the mean of group two to be a positive number that would be on the right side of our distribution. This is going to be a right-tailed test. Let me take at least 5,000 resamples to build the randomization sampling distribution, and then I'll select right tail. The difference in our sample, x1 minus x2, was three, so we need to change this value at the bottom, the cutoff, to three so we can find our p-value. The p-value here is 0 0.102. This procedure is going to be the same for the difference in proportions. I'll just walk through an example really quickly. We used the own tablet by sex data set here. Again, take at least 5,000 resamples. and select left tail, two tail, or right tail, depending on your research question. Uh, here, let's just say that we have a two tail hypothesis, so we want to know if there's some difference, any difference, between males and females. The difference in the original sample was negative 0 0.033, which would fall here on the left side of our sampling distribution. So we're going to change the value on the left side to negative 0 0.033. With a two-tailed test, the p-value is going to be the total in the two tails combined, 0 0.135 plus 0 0.135 gives us a p-value of 0 0.270. The last example will be for a correlation. We'll use the Florida Lakes data set again, 
and it'll generate at least 5,000 resamples. Let's say that we're doing a left tailed test here. So we want to know if the correlation in the population is negative. Again, don't forget to change the value at the bottom to match the value in the original sample. In our original sample, correlation was negative 0 0.575. The p-value here, stat key will say is 0 0.000. Technically, the p-value can never be zero because there's always a chance that the results were due to random sampling variation. So I would write this as p is less than 0.001. Now that you know how to find the p-value in stat key, I'll take you back to the PowerPoint slides to show you the steps for finding the p-value for a randomization test using Minitab Express. Finding the randomization tests looks different with Windows and Mac versions of Minitab Express. With Windows, go to Statistics, Resampling, then select either one sample mean, one sample proportion, or two sample means. These are the only options in Minitab Express. It will not do two sample proportions, slope, or correlation. On a Mac, it looks different, but you'll still go to Statistics, resampling, and then select one of the three tests that are available in Minitab Express. Because Minitab Express only has three options, and because it will only take 1,000 resamples at a time, we'll be using stat key almost all of the time in this course. If you do run a randomization test in Minitab Express, this is what the output will look like. It will give you a histogram of the randomization distribution, this is comparable to the dot plot that stat key gives you. The red area on this histogram is the p-value. The output will give you a summary of the original sample with the hypotheses written out. Here we can see that we did a two-tailed test and the hypothesized value was 0.5. And then the last table, it will give you the p-value. Unlike StatKey, Minitab Express will add the two tails together for you here. This brings us to our fourth learning objective, interpret p-values. What we mean by this is really applying the definition of a p-value to a specific scenario. This isn't explicitly part of the five-step hypothesis testing procedure, but like I said earlier, p-values are one of the most misinterpreted and misunderstood statistical concepts. But it's important that you understand what they actually mean, since they'll play a major role in hypothesis testing. Here's the definition that we saw earlier for a p-value. If I bring back the output that we just saw from Minitab Express, the p-value here was 0 0.244. To interpret this, I would say, if the population proportion were 0 0.5, the probability of taking a random sample of 100 and finding a sample proportion of 0 0.44 or more extreme is 0 0.244. Or, in other words, if the population proportion were 0 0.5, 22.4% of random samples of n equals 100 would have a sample proportion of 0 0.44 or more extreme. Our last learning objective this week is to make conclusions on the basis of a p-value. Recall the interpretation of a p-value that we just looked at. If the p-value is small, then it is unlikely that our sample came from a population with a hypothesized value. In terms of what is unlikely enough, the cutoff is usually set at 0.05. This is known as the alpha level. Unless otherwise stated, assume that the alpha level is 0.05. Next week in lesson six, We'll learn about times we might want to use a larger or smaller alpha level. But for now, we assume that alpha is 0.05 unless we're told otherwise. In other words, 
we're saying that if there's less than a 5% chance that a population with the given parameter would produce a sample with the statistic that we observed in our sample, then we conclude that it is unlikely that our sample came from that population. If your p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05, reject the null hypothesis. Recall that the null hypothesis was that there is no difference in the population. When we reject the null hypothesis, we're saying that there is some difference in the population. This is what we call statistically significant results. If the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, fail to reject the null hypothesis. The results are not statistically significant. When we fail to reject the null, that means that there is not evidence of a difference in the population. A really important point here is that failing to reject the null is not equivalent to accepting the null. We never accept the null hypothesis. The way that the logic of hypothesis testing works, we cannot say that a population parameter equals a certain value. We can only say whether or not there is evidence that it's different. Now that we've covered all of the learning objectives for this lesson, I want to go back to do a few complete examples using the five-step hypothesis testing procedure. Let's start with the example that we saw at the very beginning. A company claims that only 2% of their products break within the first month. You've purchased 50 of these products and four have broken within the first month. Do you have evidence to claim that more than 2% of this company's products break within a month? Step one is to determine the type of test you need to conduct and write the hypotheses. We have data from one sample and the variable that we're testing is whether or not the product breaks within a month. This is a categorical variable. We are testing a single proportion. We know that the parameter in the hypotheses is going to be P and we want to know if more than 2% break. So the hypothesized proportion is 0.02, and this is a right-tailed test. These are our hypotheses. Steps two and three I'm actually going to combine here because we'll do both of these in StatKey. Step two is to construct a randomization distribution given that the null hypothesis is true. And step three is to use the randomization distribution to find the p-value. When we go to StatKey, we'll need to remember the hypothesized value and that this is a right-tailed test. We'll also need to remember our sample data. We have four out of 50 that broke. Let's go to StatKey now to conduct this single sample proportion test. This is not a data set that is built into StatKey, but it's very easy to enter our own data for a proportion. Go to Edit Data. In our sample, four out of 50 products broke. Now we can see our sample data in the original sample box on the right. The default hypothesized value is 0.5. But our null hypothesis was that p equals 0.02, so we need to change this value. Now we take at least 5,000 resamples to build our randomization sampling distribution. This is step two of the five step hypothesis testing procedure. This was a right tailed test. We need to remember to change the cutoff at the bottom to the original sample proportion, which was 0 0.080. Our p-value is 0 0.016. This is step three of the five-step hypothesis testing procedure. If you're doing this for a lab assignment, take a screenshot of this distribution with the p-value. In addition to pasting this distribution plot in your lab, you should always write a short statement to identify your answer. Here I would write, 
P equals 0 0.016. Back to the five-step procedure. Step four is to decide if you should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Our p-value was less than 0.05, so we reject the null hypothesis. And the last step, we state a real-world conclusion in relation to the original research question, which was, do you have evidence to claim that more than 2% of this company's products break within a month? Yes. We rejected the null hypothesis. This means that there is evidence that more than 2% of this company's products break within a month. Let's look at one last example. A random sample of 10 students at one school were given an IQ test. Is there evidence that the mean IQ at this school is different from 100? Their scores were 85, 90, 95, 100, 105, 105, 105, 110, 115, and 130. Step one is to determine what type of test you need to conduct and write the hypotheses. We have data from one group of students. The variable that we're working with is IQ scores, which are quantitative. This means that we're going to conduct a test for a single mean. Our hypotheses are going to be written out in terms of mu because mu is the population mean. The hypothesized value that we're given is 100. We want to know if scores are different from 100, so we don't have a direction. This is going to be a two-tailed test. The null hypothesis is that mu equals 100, and the alternative is that mu does not equal 100. Steps two and three, we're going to go to stat key to do. Before we go there, you might want to pause the video now to write down the hypotheses and the 10 IQ scores in this sample. We said that this would be a test for a single mean. We have our own data set, which we can read into stat key by editing the data. Select all and delete the old data set and enter in our 10 IQ scores. 85, 90, 95, 100, 105, 105, 105, 110, 115, and 130. We do not have a column of identifiers, so we leave the first box unchecked. We do not have a header row, so we'll also need to uncheck the second box. When I click OK, we can see our sample in the original sample box on the right. We need to change the hypothesized value of the population mean to match our null hypothesis, which was that mu equals 100. Now we can take at least 5,000 resamples to build our randomization sampling distribution. Here's our randomization distribution. This is step two of the five-step hypothesis testing procedure. Step three is to find the p-value on here. This was a two-tailed test, so I'll select two-tail. And we need to remember to change the cutoff at the bottom to the original sample mean, which was 104. 104 would fall on the right side of the distribution, so we're going to change the cutoff on the right side to 104. Our p-value is the total red area in the two tails. That's 0 0.158 on the left plus 0 0.158 on the right. This gives us a p-value of 0 0.316. This means that if the population mean were really 100, 31.6% of random samples of 10 would still have a mean of 104 or more extreme. I'll take you back to the PowerPoint slides to finish with steps four and five. Step four 
is to decide if you should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Our p-value was greater than 0.05, so we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Step 5. State a real-world conclusion in relation to the original research question. We failed to reject the null hypothesis, so no, there is not evidence that the mean IQ score at this school is different from 100. This concludes the Lesson 5 lecture video. There are more examples in the online notes. And as always, if you have any questions, please post them to the Lesson 5 discussion board in Canvas.